Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, here in the virtual Keene State College Meet and Greet. We are um, unveiling publicly today our new director of the Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Peter McBride, and we are just thrilled to have you join us here today. I'm Melinda Treadwell, I'm the president at Keene State College, and it is my honor to serve this institution and this community. Um, the Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies is one of the oldest Holocaust resource centers in the entire United States, celebrating its 37th year this fall. And since the time that Dr. Charles Hildebrandt created the center, with the goal of remembering and teaching the lessons of the Holocaust, we have continued to be part of an evolution of a center that has expanded its awareness into areas of genocide, mass atrocity, and more recently, the challenges of systemic ra racism, oppression, and human rights violations globally. The Cohen Center has been at, at the heart of Keene State College and our values since its inception. It is a part of our mission as a public liberal arts institution that educates our students, but creates more importantly, a place for our community, our faculty and staff, and our students to come together to become critical thinkers, those who read the original materials of, of our history, where we learn together through the tools that help us become active, engaged citizens, and those citizens specifically who are committed to social justice. The Cohen Center's work, as anyone who knows of us, reaches far beyond the walls of our physical location in Keene, New Hampshire, at the local, national, and international level. And given this, we are thrilled to welcome to our community, Peter McBride, through the generous support from an anonymous donor, we created an endowed directorship position. And Peter McBride has embodied what we sought, someone who would bring visionary leadership, a proven record of success, and specifically moving from vision to action as we think of what's important for us as a, as a society and as a world, how do we move from the call to action to actually making a difference, particularly with regard to social justice. And so as we look to the future for the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College, we think of our international presence and we welcome the leadership of Peter McBride to our community. He is the right person to stand on the legacy of our history and carry us forward into his legacy as our director um, of the Cohen Center. So Peter, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. I wish that I could come and drive you to Keene from your home in Ireland. We, we will continue to work with you to, uh, to bring you to us here in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, and with that, again, I thank all of our participants for being here. And I look forward to welcoming us all in three-dimensional community here in the coming weeks. Um, and my thanks to be here with Peter. And so with this, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kirsty Sandu, the Dean of our School of Arts, Education, and Humanities. Dr. Sandu. Thank you very much, Melinda, for that introduction. And um, I welcome you all here today. It's so wonderful to be here to be introducing Peter again. Like Melinda, I truly wish that this had been in person. That would have been ideal. This is second best. And so I appreciate this opportunity very much. So I want to thank everyone who brought this event together because I am so excited to introduce Peter today. Um, I'm especially excited because this was a two year search process and I chaired it for the full two years. And I so believe that we found exactly the right person to lead. This was not a decision that any of us took lightly. Um, and as I say this, I want to also appreciate here um, Celia Rabinowitz and Paul Vincent for taking the helm this year as interim co-directors. They did an excellent job and they're really helping Peter make the transition now. So thank you. Um, again, to your search process, we really are very fortunate that we found exactly the right person to lead us. And I want to tell you a little bit about Peter today and really what made him, in our minds, such a strong candidate for this position. Um, he grew up in the shadow of violence in Northern Ireland. So this is something that he experienced firsthand. Um, he took all of this and he ended up really um, learning and thinking about ways to prevent violence and to help people who have who have dealt with by systematic violence. Um, he ended up becoming a post-conflict mental health specialist, focusing on trauma, and not trauma in the way that we typically think about, like as a, as a therapist might with someone who has undergone trauma, 
but trauma writ large, trauma not just on individual people, although he does, he does that work, but on ethnic groups, communities, institutions, and how trauma kind of repeats itself through generations, even after the initial trauma is, first trauma is over. So he really thinks very, in a very large way about how trauma works in, our, in different cultures and how to work with that. Um, Important to him are the principles of human rights and human dignity. And this kept coming up again when we interviewed him and specific instances of where he has really thought about ways to maintain human dignity and recover in trauma recovery and make people feel like full human beings again. Um, he received his master's in social work in 1996 at Queens College in Belfast. And he received an advanced diploma um, in the management of psychological trauma. So it sounds like a relatively new field um, at Nottingham University in 1998. So he has a lot of experience with this. He has chaired a working group that addressed social justice and legacy issues going back over 100 years at the Magdalene Laundries. And some of you may have heard about that. Um, he's also chaired a few organizations. Um, one of them is a Journey Towards Healing, which is a resource used by faith communities um, in Northern Ireland to support victims of trauma. So he's worked in lots of different groups. He's been a trustee at the BBC's Children in Need. Um, that's a fairly high profile organization. I had heard of it as I had heard of it too. Um, they have a big television presence as well. So lots of media presence there. Um, one of the best known national organizations in the United Kingdom. Um, he's been a fellow and resident speaker. And some of you may have heard of this, the Global Raphael Lemkin Seminar for Genocide Prevention run by the Auschwitz Institute. Um, and has been a visiting professor at Ulster University, Brantford Center for Mental Health. Um, he's, in this, he's worked closely with Lord John Alderdice, and um, I know he's out in the audience, so hello. <laughs> nice, to, nice to talk to you again. Um, in the Center of, for the Resolution of Intractable Conflict. Peter's skills as a visionary leader, and again, this is coming after the, the CEO of Inspire, one of the largest um, workplace wellness organizations in the UK, where he grew it from a small organization to a much larger one, and thinking about what it really takes, um, not just in terms of vision, but in terms of organization and structure, um, to really, really create an organization that works to maintain human dignity and social justice. Um, so a few things I want to tell you about Peter, um, and I don't want to run through his whole resume because you can see that and you have seen that, but a few things that really make him a great fit for this position. First of all, his proven ability to cultivate talent. He has a wonderful sense of what the skills are of the people around him. And uh, when I was talking to his references over and over again, people just said, this is a real skill of Peter's, that he's able to figure out who is good at what and have them work together in collaboration. And that's something I really wanted to see happening. Um, and, you know, all of this for the common good. Um, an excellent communicator. So he's been called upon in many instances to make media appearances. He's a proven communicator. He has a compassion and concern for human dignity and human rights. And I think what spoke to all of us the most when we were doing this interview process is his, his real sense of optimism that we can effectively address trauma, that this is something that we are capable of doing, that it's work and it's work that we can do together, but it's work that he saw the Cohen Center as doing. He really values the Cohen Center as an organization. He really sees great potential. He loves the work we've been doing and could really envision himself as leading it. And that really spoke to all of us because we could see him leading it as well. So I am, I'm so excited about his commission, uh, his commitment to our mission as a center. And I really look forward to, to hearing him talk today. But enough of me. Um, you'll, you really are waiting here to hear from Peter. So again, I want to thank our generous donors. And I also want to thank um, Peter McBride today for being here and for being a, a part of King State and a part of the Cohen Center. Thank you. Kirsty uh, and Melinda, thank you so much uh, for that extremely generous and quite overwhelming welcome. Um, I've, I've st I started work at the beginning of July and, and over the last number of weeks I've spent a lot of time uh, on Zoom speaking with many of you perhaps who, who are here today and I have to say that every Every single individual I've spoken to has been enthusiastic about the work of the Cohen Centre, has been enthusiastic about the college and the relationship between the Cohen Centre and the college. And, and, I, and the other thing that I suppose I've been struck by is how 
um, positive people are and hopeful about the future. So, so I'm going to track for you a little bit of the journey that, that Kirsty has described of what has taken me from growing up in Northern Ireland to ending up in, in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, so as, as you said, I was born in the 60s. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit I was born in 1964, so I'm 56. Uh, and the troubles here started in 1969 and went through right until 1998. So all through my formative years, I was growing up in a, in, within a society where um, bombing, uh, murder, people being shot, uh, the presence of security forces on the streets uh, was a common occurrence. It was normal. And, and I, I suppose I want to I reinforce that a little bit about what that feels like, because when, when I say it feels normal, I mean it feels normal. You don't think there's anything wrong with it. It doesn't seem unusual. Uh, it was only when I went off to university when I was 18 and, and walked into shops and sort of stood at the door with my arms out waiting to be searched with people looking at me strangely uh, that I began to realize that actually what I had grown up with was not normal. Uh, and, and I have spent the, the rest of my life finding myself surprised uh, at the things that I accepted as normal or thought of as being normal when I was growing up that really weren't. Um, and that normalization of violence uh, brought me, when I came back uh, from university, uh, into working with, uh, particularly at that stage, with bereavement. And so I, I've always worked in the voluntary sector. I've always worked with communities, with people. Uh, and I find myself working in an organization that was supporting people who were bereaved. Uh, and I noticed in that context that people who had been bereaved as a consequence of the troubles grieved differently. Their grief was difficult. It was compromised by the experience of trauma that was associated with the death. Uh, and often the grief was unresolved, um, even with significant time. Uh, and I began to, to think about what impact trauma was having on how people were coping with the peace process, how, how uh, the impact of trauma changed both individuals and organizations' ability to make peace. Because one of the things that trauma does is it affects the way we remember. In other words, you know, if, if we have a sad experience happen to us, then we go through a process where we feel the pain of that. But after a period of time, those feelings start to subside. We start to move on. We can remember what happened, but it doesn't necessarily affect us. Whereas when you talk to someone who's been traumatized, um, it's like the event happened yesterday, even though it might have happened 20 years ago. Uh, and, and this is important because part of the uh, process of healing for any community after atrocity and violence is the ability to create memories uh, and to, to, to move on. Uh, and with the presence of trauma, that is often, that is often compromised. So, uh, so I became very involved then in the Northern Ireland peace process, particularly around peace and reconciliation, trying to understand how those experiences of trauma that people had affected their ability to engage in reconciliation processes and their ability to engage in, in forming the, the new Northern Ireland that, that we are all seeking to live in now. And as I sit here with you, so you can tell, uh, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Northern Ireland. I haven't been able to get over to you yet because of the, the visa ban. Uh, but as we sit here now in Northern Ireland, while I am, I want to be able to say that I'm hopeful about the future. I'm not sure how terribly hopeful I am about the future of peace here, because as I sit here, uh, Children are still going to schools based on the religion that they grew up in. People shop in different shops depending on the religion that they identify with. If I get sick, I will go to a particular hospital if I come from one side of the community. If I come from one side of the community, I still play separate sports to what the other side of the community plays. And so despite the fact that uh, we have a form of peace since 1998, the fundamental divisions that led to the violence are still around. And my contention is that the experience of trauma is what feeds those divisions. It's what gives them energy. It, it internalizes fear so that whenever I feel anxious and frightened and want to blame somebody, I create another in who, for whom to blame. And that othering of people is one of the things that makes the link now between the work that I've done up until now and the work of the Cohen Center. Because when you look at the, this unique experience of the Holocaust, uh, perhaps the most significant experience of industrialized killing, uh, certainly in, in recorded history, then uh, all the component parts of that, the, the component steps in that, 
involved uh, a process of othering a group in society, of seeing it as separate, as not worthy of life, and a threat. And, and my contention is that the experience of trauma helps feed that. So one of the reasons, as Kirsty said, I am so overwhelmingly excited about coming to the Cohen Center is the opportunity that it gives me for what I've started to describe as applied Holocaust and genocide studies. In other words, taking the, the lessons from the Holocaust, taking all the understanding that, that we have from the work in the, the Holocaust and Genocide Studies program with Jim Waller and his colleagues, um, taking all of that and applying it, as Melinda articulated, to the challenges that we face today. Applying it to all of the othering we are seeing going on, whether that be in terms of racism, Black Lives Matter, whether it's to do with gender, sexuality, ethnicity, whatever it is, when a society starts to um, identify others and, and apply negative connotations to them, then we know that that, that, is, that is one of the early steps, I suppose, towards uh, what can become, if left unchallenged and unabated, uh, genocide and atrocity. Uh, and so I, I, I take really seriously uh, the 37 year history of the, the Cohen Center. Uh, when Chuck Hildebrand set it up, he set it up with the motto to remember and to teach. Um, so the remembering bit is that making sure we really understand what happened, uh, that we remind a generation that is growing up now, uh, who perhaps have never, never even heard of the Holocaust or heard that it happened. So that educational piece is really important. But what is equally important, and, and, I would say, and I would argue is compelling when we look at society around us, is to take the lessons of the Holocaust, take the lessons of the genocides that have happened subsequently and prior to it, and are happening as we speak here and now, take those lessons and apply them to the societies we live in. So if you look at the United States, if I look at my home country here, if I look at what's going on in the rest of the UK, if I look at what's going on in Europe, if I look at what's going on in China or in Russia, there are lots and lots of signs that should make us feel very, very concerned. Uh, but the hopeful bit, which Kirsty alluded to, is that there is something we can do about this. Um, if we identify this, then by speaking about it, by putting in place efforts at reconciliation, by making sure we understand one another, then we start to mitigate the effects of that. And that brings me finally on to the bit of this that I think is probably the hardest. I think it's, it is interesting for me, let me say it like this, to sit here in Northern Ireland and watch what's going on in the States. Um, and one of the things that's easy to do is to pass judgment. So I can do it, you know, I can do it on my own country here. What's really difficult for us to do both as communities as individual and as individuals is to look within ourselves. Because one of the things I've been challenged with over all of my career is that, that I carry within me prejudice. I carry within me the capacity to do the harm that I've seen other people do to others. I, I could have been, had I grown up in that environment, I could have done some of the things that I've criticized other people for doing. I tell a story often of being in Rwanda and visiting a, 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 a church there where, where the remains of the victims were still lying on the floor and I had to step on, on the pews to walk around. And I find myself strongly identifying, not with the victims, although I was deeply moved by it, but strongly identifying with the people who did it because the people who did it were just like me. They were friends and neighbors who had gone through a process of indoctrination, had been affected by a whole variety of things that led them to massacre one another. So the work that we need to do, we need to do with communities, we need to do with one another and we need to do with ourselves where we open ourselves up to exploring um, the prejudices we have and, and naming those. And I have to say in conclusion that the experience I've had thus far in the Cohen Centre and talking to so many people and exploring how we move forward, how we engage with such difficult social issues, how we do it sensitively and humanely with compassion and tenderness, understanding that we are dealing with broken people. We are broken people in a broken society. So how do we bring healing in that? How do we allow opportunity for people to talk about what has happened to them and how they're feeling and how marginalized and hurt they feel, both by systems and by other individuals? 
And what I have found in talking about that is a, is a wonderful enthusiasm and compassionate openness to do something about this. Uh, and that, if anything, apart from all of the other things, that is the thing that makes me most excited about taking on this role. Um, and, and I can't tell you how impatient I am to be with you in person. Um, I'm really getting frustrated with Zoom, um, but it is what it is. Um, so, so all I can say is uh, I'm, I appreciate greatly the, the warmth of the welcome that you've shown to me already. I look forward to being able to experience that in person when I'm with you uh, 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 in the flesh, so to speak. Uh, and I want to thank you for all the support that you've given me, even up until this point. So thank you very much. Peter, I was just curious if you could um, share some thoughts about entering. Um, so this is something keeping me up at night. So we have a presidential election uh, coming at a time of great unrest in our country. And from your experience, um, could you talk a little bit about the role of the Cohen Center from your perspective, the thought leadership that we have as a college campus and a community and those you've spoken with about things we might be able to do as a college together to help support a, a fragile community at a very difficult time? Brilliant question, Melinda, and, and extremely, uh, extremely important for us to think about this. Um, I have observed here in Northern Ireland the capacity for politicians to use conflict, to use vulnerable and, and marginalised groups for political ends, and, I, and I'm afraid that's what I see happening in the States at the moment. Uh, and therefore, it is really important that in the middle of this, that the Cohen Centre models something different. And what we need to be able to model is how people can talk about and discuss difference in a way that is constructive. Um, so there's a danger that we just surround ourselves with people that agree with us and make us feel good about ourselves and make us feel good about the way we think. But going back to what I said before, that will never challenge us to understand ourselves differently or indeed to understand our complicity, our part in creating some of the problems that there have been. I mean, I tend to take a corporate view of things. So while I'm not personally responsible for the situation in Northern Ireland, somehow or other, I played my part by being a citizen here. Um, and I would say the same about the states, that, that everybody needs to think about their, their own role and question that. But what the Cohen Centre can do is to create a safe enough place for that to happen. And I use the word safe enough very um, specifically. Not so safe that it just feels comfortable for people to say anything. Because not everything is acceptable. Not everything is, is helpful. But safe enough for people to be able to take some risks but for it to feel edgy enough for us to be challenged. So, so what I think the Cohen Centre can do is, that, is this idea of creating space where conversations can happen that cannot happen elsewhere, uh, where people can hear about things that they won't hear about being talked about elsewhere, and where they can experience that in the context of support, learning, and, and, and appropriate challenge. Um, so, I mean, and, and, and to do it in the context of building relationships. I want to have friends. I want to make friends when I come out to Keene with people that I really fundamentally don't agree with. But I want them to be friends. And I want, I want those people to help me understand why they believe what they believe when I look at it and think I couldn't, you know, there's no way, there's no way you can think that when actually people do. And I need to understand that. But really the only way I'm going to do that is to honestly listen and open myself up to genuine encounter. Uh, with them and with those ideas. Thank you so much. And um, I'm reaffirmed every time I read about uh, you and your work and by that answer that you are exactly the right leader to guide us forward as, as the school that we are with the value and the visions, um, vision that we hold um, because that is brilliant. And I'm very excited about you joining us to help us with this because I think it is a very, very essential part of our future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. So I would like to open it up now for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in. I know Peter is ready to answer some. And I wanted to start, Peter, with a question for you. I heard just today that the governor of New Hampshire, Governor Sununu, is requiring that Holocaust and genocide studies be taught in all schools. And I was very pleased to hear that. I know that we have so many people on our team that 
um, help make that possible, like Tom White and Jim Waller and so many others, and I'm sure the Cohen family and others. So I just wanted to get your perspective on when you heard that news and how did you feel about it? And did you have any ideas brewing that we might be able to capitalize on? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've known about it. Tom has been involved. So this didn't happen out of the blue. And I do want to commend my predecessor, uh, Hank Knight, and then also the work of, uh, of Celia and Paul uh, over the last year in terms of holding the fort, because um, th there's been a huge amount of work done, uh, you know, in, in my absence before I started. Um, so I'm incredibly excited about this. Um, Tom had direct engagement with this. I think he gave evidence. And, and again, what I will say this, one of the things that has been consistent uh, in me talking to people over the last two or three weeks is the, the, the number of people who have spoken positively about the work that Tom does out in the community and specifically in schools. And I would argue that that work has paid off in this bill in the sense that Tom is seen as an expert in this area. Uh, he gave evidence to the committee and I think was significantly influential with others uh, in making sure that this happened. This gives us a, a fantastic opportunity, um, largely because we already have an infrastructure in place through Tom and the work that he does. Um, so what this gives us is the opportunity to build on that. Um, the work that I'm doing at the moment in talking to people is the precursor to creating a strategy for the Cohen Centre that will take us into the next, in the coming months and years. Um, I don't want to preempt the detail of that, but one thing I'm absolutely sure about, uh, sure will be present in that, is a significant component of that is going to have to be about education, about the, the role that we can have in schools, working with young people. Uh, and it's very important, the bill is not a Holocaust bill, it's a Holocaust and genocide education bill. So it allows us to broaden that out um, in thinking of Holocaust, genocide, and also the human rights issues that are intrinsically linked with this. You can't talk about, and, and going back to my idea of uh, or my, my language of applied Holocaust and genocide studies, you know, if we think about what happened in the Holocaust, if we understand the process that leads countries uh, to, uh, and, and, and ethnic groups to commit genocide, then we in inevitably end up talking about human rights issues and, and how we should treat one another and how we deal with difference. Um, so I just, I'm extremely excited about it. I think it's really, um, I think it's really serendipitous uh, that it's happened at this time. I'd love to be able to, the only problem I have is I'd love to be able to take credit for it, but sadly I can't. Uh, um, <laughs> but, but I will certainly take, I will certainly take full advantage of it uh, in the, in the sense that the opportunity, uh, it gives us a really, wonderful opportunity uh, and I really want to com commend Tom and the work that he's done uh, to get us to that because uh, it has been fantastic. Thank you. We have questions that are starting to come in. So the first one is what have you learned about the center as you've begun interviewing stakeholders? Ah, that is a, a great great question. I have learned that the center is um, extremely well regarded. Um, I have been I have been really quite struck by the degree of um, respect and admiration and commitment that people have to the center. And I, and I, and I have to say, from, come on from a whole variety of positions. So I have been really intentionally trying to speak with as many people, uh, people from as many different backgrounds as possible. I've spoken with faculty, I've spoken with one student, and I've spoken with a lot of people from the community. I've spoken with people outside of the community. Uh, I've spoken with people actually this side of the water. Um, Sir Andrew Burns, I, I spoke to last week, who was the British ambassador to Israel and spoke a number of times at the Cohen Center, but, is, but, is, but lives in England. Uh, and and they, all, uh, they all said different things, but what was clear from all of them was the level of respect, admiration, um, and, and indeed commitment to the Cohen Centre. People want to help. Um, they, they, they see the centre as being able to play a role that I think other organisations and other uh, entities are going to find it difficult to do. So we, uh, we in the Cohen Centre are perfectly placed to deal with these, some of these issues. Uh, and I think what was quite significant in, in, in speaking with people was how eager they were for the Cohen Centre to step into that space and to kind of take, up, take on this role and to step into that space where these kind of conversations and this sort of engagement was able to happen. Um, so I find it extremely reassuring. You know, I, it's a bit like a marriage, isn't it? Whenever you go for a new job, you don't quite know uh, what you're taking on. So there, you want a little bit of a courtship and you want to try and find out, well, I'm finding out a lot and, and I'm really 
enjoying and getting excited, even more excited by what I'm hearing. Excellent. Thank you. Another question is, so much of what we're seeing is status quo and thinking, and it's hard to get people inside the box to realize society is made up in someone's mind of what it should be. How do we get people to see our country needs revising? That's a really, really interesting question. I mean, I think one of the challenges, is, one of the things that is so unsettling at the moment is that it is fairly difficult at the minute not to feel provoked. Um, so I think external circumstances are forcing people to feel uneasy. That's forcing people to question things. Uh, it's forcing people to think about things. Now that can be a negative thing, and, and we've seen the results of that because when people, because what happens with that is that people get anxious and they get scared. And anxiety and fear, and the other word I'll put into this is shame. Um, what if once we see the world in binary terms of right and wrong, good and evil, um, victim and perpetrator, then what that leads to is the, is feelings of shame on the side of those who are being blamed. And shame is a deeply destructive emotion and cuts people off from connection. So what we need to do uh, in that situation is, in light of all the stimulation that's going on around us, where people are being provoked to think about things, is to give a constructive place, uh, a place where people can think about things constructively. And my experience with that is gonna sound a bit strange to you. I've used, I used the word earlier on, compassion. I find myself using this word a lot because compassion, if you think of the original Greek or Latin, I can't remember, I think it's Greek uh, etymology of it, it means to suffer with. Uh, and I, my experience of this is that when you get people starting off talking not about what's right and wrong, but about the basic human experience of suffering. What is it like to be me? What is it like to be you? What are your fears? What are your anxieties? What does all this stuff that's going on in the world around us, how does that make you feel? And, and what are you frightened about? Then what happens with that is that that experience of the human condition is a uniting experience. It starts people connecting with one another at a much deeper level. Uh, and, it, and it rustles people, it sort of, it pushes people out of that sense of complacency and gets them to start to think about things and be able to hear one another differently and start to deal with the sort of uncomfortable process of trying to see things from another's perspective. So a very insightful question, not easy to do, but I'm hopeful that there is a way to do it. Excellent. I'm going to um, take two questions and merge them together. Um, one of the questions is, how do you see expanding the center's impact and footprint beyond the region? And what is your vision for the center's future over the next five years? And will okay. it look different depending on the November election results? Um, so, so very interesting question. Um, so what was the first of those, Veronica? It was about... The first one was, how do you envision expanding the center's footprint in the yeah. future? Okay. And um, yeah. I know you just started, so please bear with us. <laughs> no, no, we haven't no, no. Yeah. So form, formulated a plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, th I think this is really important. So uh, right from the start, so my experience, what brought me into this was through the work that I've done with Jim Waller um, in the Auschwitz Institute out in Poland. So Jim very generously invited me to take part in the Raphael Lemkin um, series out there. And I, I taught uh, as part of that on, on um, trauma the experience of trauma as one of the risk factors around genocide. Um, and, and through Jim, then I heard about the work of the Cohen Center. So for me, my first experience of the Cohen Center was international. It was the reach that the Cohen Center has way beyond Keene, way beyond the States, right into the kind of global um, peacekeeping world or the world of certainly of genocide prevention where Jim and the work he, he does with the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Department is, is internationally renowned. I mean, this is, this is a course that people all over the world hear about, admire, and benefit from. Uh, and so the credentials of the Cohen Center through Jim's work are second to none internationally. Uh, and, and, I, and my experience then in, in getting to know this will work better, both locally and nationally, uh, has done nothing but confirm that and expand that. So I have, I have always seen the work of the Cohen Center uh, as sort of concentric circles coming out from the center. So the heart of the Cohen Center is in the college and in Keene. And it is intimately linked with the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Department. Um, I am not a Holocaust scholar. It is not my expertise. 
I am a post-conflict mental health expert. That's, that's what I know most. I understand what happened in the Holocaust and, and I understand the process of uh, the development of genocide. But, but my reassurance about this is that expertise resides within the Cohen Center, uh, within the faculty that we have. We have world experts on Holocaust and genocide studies um, within two paces of my office. Uh, and that means that the center has this rich core of intellectual and academic ability upon which we then build the teaching bit, which is the engagement moving out in concentric circles with the local community. And, and I'm, I, I value your question, Veronica, and I'm, I will answer it as best I can, but I'm not going to reach big conclusions because it is really important for me to listen to what the community wants and needs um, and I think the Cohen Center needs to go through a bit of a period now with me of listening to what the community needs and the role that it can fulfill with the community. The, the, work, with, uh, the work on education at, Nash, at, at the state level is an example of what we can do as those concentric circles start to move out uh, into state involvement. Uh, and I think nationally, uh, I'm, I'm already involved in a couple of committees uh, that are, are representative committees of, of Holocaust and genocide centers and human rights centers that are looking at, at, at whole nation uh, approaches. So thinking about the, the US as a whole. Uh, and then of course the international work, which I'm particularly interested in as well, because I think we have something incredibly valuable to contribute to. I was out in South Sudan with USAID in January and, and I realized that for many, well, there, there's lots of humanitarian aid going on. There's very little understanding of the psychological and mental health needs of communities after atrocities. Uh, and that's some work that I think we can do. Your last part of your question was about the outcome of the election in November. Um, what I'll say about that is this, that as I watch what's going on in America, I see a, a society that is broken and breaking irrespective of who your president is, there has been a huge amount of damage that has been done and a huge amount of healing that is required. If I bring in the possibility, as I do believe, that, that trauma is, is transmitted generation by generation, then you know one way of interpreting the United States of America is that it is the country that is built on two atrocities. One was the genocide of the indigenous people and the other was, the, uh, was slavery. Uh, and, and the trauma of those events and many other events uh, is part of what is built into the DNA of the country. And, and we are seeing, I believe, in Black Lives Matter and what's going on at the minute, some of the product of that. Now, that is really, really difficult stuff to talk about. It's really difficult. Um, and we need to be incredibly sensitive and compassionate and careful about how we deal with it. But we have to deal with it. Um, and so irrespective of who wins the election in November, the damage is done, the society is in need of, of healing, and we need to find mechanisms to do that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have another question that's come in, and it is the number of Holocaust survivors is now dropping at a significant rate. The loss of these witnesses to the Holocaust is immense. What priority will you give to Holocaust remembrance in light of this? So Holocaust remembrance is central to the identity of the Cohen Center. And, and I, I, I really resist the idea that anybody has of, of turning this, uh, of making this a binary understanding that it's either we do Holocaust work or we get involved in some of the things I've described. These are both and, in fact, one is built on the other. So the, the lens through which we interpret the world around us is the Holocaust. Uh, and I, I've spoken often of the risk that we face now of the Holocaust uh, receding beyond living memory. And, and what I mean by that is within the question that we are going to reach a point within the next number of years where there is no living survivor, there's no living witness to those atrocities. Uh, and what we are left with is the written record and whatever archives and resources that we have. And so the challenge from Chuck Hildebrand to remember and to teach um, becomes even more important. Um, it is even more important that we maintain the memory and the understanding of the Holocaust at the front of people's minds uh, as they seek to interpret what's going on nowadays. Um, and that we use uh, as many uh, of the archives and, and uh, the resources that we have to make that alive for young people growing up today. I, I, I had the 
I want to share this with you. My, uh, my first grandchild was born on Sunday. I was really delighted. I, I started talking about this at an event I was speaking at yesterday and I welled up and started to cry, which was a bit embarrassing in front of 30 people. But um, I'm not going to do that with you today. I've, I've kind of contained myself a bit. But I'm so emotional. I'm so overwhelmed at the birth of this little baby. He's my, he's my first grandchild. His little boy, his name is Odin. He has his whole life ahead of him. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sitting here thinking, what kind of world is he going to grow up into? And what can I do with the time that I have left to make sure that I make my contribution to that being as good as it can be? Um, and, and when we think of, of, of tracking back to the Holocaust and think about all that we need, the, the horror in that, the, the absolute unspeakable horror of what happened and the risk that that could happen again in another form, then, then I think it is that that should motivate us to change. Uh, and so it is, it is incredibly important to me. Uh, I, I took on this job understanding that Holocaust was at the center of the Cohen Center's identity and that it will, re as long as I'm involved, it will remain at the center of uh, the Cohen Center's identity. Congratulations on your new grandchild. That is so exciting. Celia had reminded me that I need to be sure to thank, uh, to congratulate you. So I'm sorry that I didn't start off with that. <laughs> it's very thank exciting. You. Thank you. We have um, two more comments, actually. Um, one is they look forward to the education of the broader community as well as schools to have those difficult conversations with our community of taking the work beyond the college and schools into the community with parents, leaders, and other general population. Yes. So they're commending you on your vision and the need to expand the role. Another comment is, it's a comment, not a question. Your weariness with Zoom is understandable, yet Zoom has given you a remarkable opportunity to connect with the broader Keene New Hampshire community. And um, let me see. The impression you've made from Northern Ireland is overwhelmingly positive. People have come to know you. While that's overwhelm overwhelmingly owed to you, it's also owed to this electronic product. And we're so grateful we have it, and we're so grateful we have you. Could, could I say something about that? That's a lovely thing, and I, I, I just think that's I, – I really appreciate that. That's a good example of the sort of warmth that I have experienced in Zoom. I'm, I, I am tired of Zoom, but I'm also excited by it. Um, you know, we live in a world where it is not acceptable for people across the world uh, to speak to one another like this. And so, you know, the resources that we can access in this, I have a friend, uh, you know him, uh, Vahidin uh, from Bosnia. I, I've got a Zoom call with him coming up, but we can have lectures, we can have seminars, where at very little expense and really quite easily and, and accessibly now, people from all over the world will be able to have input and we can have input with them. So I absolutely agree there is huge potential in this. This is a brave new world. You know, this technology has been around for a while, but what hasn't been around has been the sort of general acceptance of it. And I think one of the positive outcomes of this horrible pandemic has been that we've all got used to this. It ceases to be a threat to us. And I think that we'll see over the coming months and years, people becoming more and more uh, confident and, and e at ease using it and, and taking full advantage of it. Absolutely. Um, one more question has just come through, so we have time for one more. And it is, I am concerned all statues to Confederacy being taken down means out of sight, out of mind, and underlying issues will not be, underlying issues will not be addressed. Could you please speak to this? Certainly. Um, the issue, this, this speaks to me about the importance of memorializing. Um, so part of a grieving process is to memorialize. Uh, and, and therefore, and, and the, the, the issues about what we put up in society as memorials or the symbols that we put up in society is incredibly contentious. Um, and, uh, and it becomes even more contentious uh, in a society that is not at peace with itself, is not in agreement about what is going on. So, um, so I think you're absolutely right. The, the danger is that we get these binary reactions. Um, it's not right or wrong. It, it is a reaction in the absence of conversation and consensus because the issues that Confederate statues represent are unresolved. It's those issues that we need to engage with. Um, whether, the, whether the statues are there or not, a community is quite capable of agreeing 
reaching consensus on if properly facilitated, but only through the process that I'm describing of being able to um, talk about the issues behind what those statues represent. So I think that what we're seeing at the moment is this sort of binary reflex reaction uh, that swings one way and swings the other. And hopefully what we will be able to create through engagement with our local community and, and, and our participation in this debate is that we create the environment in which these issues about which these statues are so provocative that we're able to create a context in which those conversations can, can take place. Excellent, thank you. We don't have any more open questions. I did want to circle back to Dr. Treadwell and Dr. Sandy to see if they had any additional questions or comments they'd like to make. I, I would just say thank you, Peter. It's you're a brilliant addition already to our community in a few weeks in uh, without being uh, in the flesh here with us in Keene. The future is bright for us, despite the challenges we all face. I am increasingly reminded of the importance of our college and of our community to show our state, our region, our nation the way. And so with you and with your colleagues, I look forward to the future ahead for all of us. And with our broader community, I think we will make a great difference. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for the leadership you'll bring. And thank you for this time today. It has been an absolute privilege to be here and share an hour in community with you and so many other people. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And um, Peter, if I might ask very, very quickly, if, if I may, um, I'm just trying to imagine the first day that you are walking in because the last time you were there, you were interviewing for the job. And it's, it feels like, it feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? It feels like it a does. long time ago to me mm -hmm. too. Um, what is one of the first things you want to do once you physically step into the building? Have you, I don't know if you've thought about <laughs> I, I know exactly what I want to do. I want to, I want to find Celia Rabinowitz's office uh, and I want to bring her a cup of coffee because uh, <laughs> she has been so good to me. And, uh, and so generous with her support of me from afar. Uh, and I feel as if I owe her so much. So I, I'm going to seek her out uh, and bring her a lovely cup of coffee and sit down and be able to uh, chat through some of the many things that we have to talk about. Uh, and, and after that, Kirsty, um, I have a list of people now who I've only spoken to on Zoom that I am determined to cook for, entertain, have round to the house for, uh, for dinner because the conversations have been so wonderful. I want to continue them. So uh, I, I love to cook. Well, I, I was going to say I love to cook. My wife will laugh when she hears me say that. Uh, I love to eat, put it like that. Um, I really love to eat. Uh, and so I love um, dinners and being able to sit down and eat with people and be hospitable. Irish people are very hospitable. Um, so all of you who are here, be prepared for an invite uh, to dinner. Uh, because that 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 uh, is definitely on the cards. But yeah, I'm looking. Uh, listen, it is lovely to even think. I, I suppose as I sit here, sometimes I wonder: is it is it go ever going to happen? But it's wonderful to think of that day when I walk up the Appian Way uh, into into the into the Cohen Center for the first time, being there. So thank you for thank you for painting that picture for me. I just want to thank everybody um, on the panel for your time today. Peter, I have enjoyed getting to know you, and I know we are going to do some wonderful work together, but have a lot of fun doing it. So I am so grateful that you're joining the Keene State family. We're so lucky to have you. And I want to show my appreciation to everybody who joined with us today. You've all been wonderful ambassadors to our program, and you are stakeholders in everything we're doing, and we're very grateful to have you with us as well. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Peter, for your thoughtful sharing, and I look forward to the next time we can all get together.